Jesse Mordeen Young is a Brooklyn-based artist who researches, makes and teaches textile art. She holds a BFA in Fibre and Material Studies and Art History and an MA in Material Culture, Design History and Object Study. In addition to her art practice, Jessie also teaches at the Parsons School of Design. Starting on January 1st, 2023, Jessie embarked on the ambitious A Woven Year project. She is weaving one unique woven drawing each day for the entire year. Collectively, these pieces create a calendar of woven days, serving as an abstract journal documenting her life as an artist. These daily works, often referred to as thread sketches, while small in scale, offer an intimate connection reminiscent of portraiture. Each piece exudes personality, ranging from sophisticated to quirky, playful and ordered. These creations directly draw from her experiences in nature, where colour and texture serve as tangible references to her memories. This deep connection to fabric, along with the meditative act of weaving, allows time to stretch, compress and facilitates experimentation. Jessie's artistic journey has been greatly influenced by her studies and travels, where she gained first-hand inspiration from various textile processes, such as block printing, surface treatments, natural dye techniques, and an appreciation for the social significance of these practices. This connection to the history of textiles and their role in communities is a central theme in her work, as Jessie explains. Textile tools and processes transmit experience, skill and knowledge. A maker must have an intimate and comprehensive understanding of the medium in order to implement these things. The textiles woven by an artist with these acquired abilities then become carriers of empathy, memory and lived experience. Textiles are evidence of humanity. So let's hear more about how these threads are connected and what it's like to tackle a marathon project as we welcome you wherever you are joining us from as we say hello to Jesse Maudine Young, this week's Friday Feature Artist. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me and I appreciate that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Tara. A pleasure. And also, um, we're not doing this live uh, today, so wherever people are tuning in from, but we'd still love to hear from you, so please feel free to let us know uh, where you're joining us from, and if you have any comments, we'd also love to hear from you as well. So we welcome everyone um, from wherever you are, and thank you for tuning in. So, uh, Jesse, I mean, weaving uh, fiber arts is often in the scheme of um, creativity is quite niche. And then I think weaving is almost even a little more niche. So I'm interested in to know what, um, what drew you to weaving in the first place and how the loom became your tool of choice. So I started out as a painter uh, in, un, in high school and became really fascinated with the relationship between colors and textures. Um, but then became introduced to the medium of weaving of variety of textile processes, including weaving um, by way of growing up in a country where craft histories and craft traditions are important to um, community, to familial lineage, uh, to the history of the place. And so that was in India. Uh, my step family is from there and uh, in by way of um, luck and, and chance, I was able to move there um, when I was a teenager and um, started to explore these different uh, textile processes, uh, became really fascinated with not only uh, the process of making itself, but also the idea of being able to create structure. Um, so with weaving, right, we have the warp, which is the vertical ends, or I have it right here <laughs> on my loom. Um, we have the vertical ends, and then the weft goes horizontally through the warp. And uh, that was really where I think it all clicked, um, this ability to um, basically create paintings while also um, create structure and so with paintings we're applying uh, pigment to a woven canvas 
Um, but now I get this opportunity to be able to kind of combine these two um, loves, uh, these two passions um, together in, in one piece, right? Yeah, yeah. And so what was the style of painting that you were, were doing? Because I'm sort of thinking of the translation of, um, yeah, even though what, what, what you just said makes sense, but yeah, you kind of go, yes, that's so, like you said, it's very much um, organized by what's going on with mm -hmm. the warp and weft, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was always interested in, in painting landscape, uh, but they became more and more abstract, just yeah. like you see within my woven works. Um, it was always, um, there was always a reference to place, to land, um, and through adding different materials, I would create that structure. So I would add sand, or I would add um, dirt, or I would create combined found objects into the paintings. It was really inspired by 20th century modernist painting, um, like uh, Robert Rauschenberg and artists like that who used a lot of um, found objects, right? And so I was also combining paper and collage, collaging things together to create kind of the base. And then I would apply paint on top of that. So it's almost like weaving made so much sense when I did approach it um, myself, not just observing it and admiring it from afar, but when I started to make um, my own works, being able to add in um, found objects and being able to really think through um, the relationship between texture and color and structure, it, it made total sense. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. And um, I do love Rauschenberg and that simplicity of, um, I was in the art gallery last week and there was a piece of his and it, you know, it just seems like this piece was the cardboard, one of the cardboard series, and so mm -hmm. there's that seemingly simplicity about it, but yet mm -hmm. also it's so compelling. Um, yeah, yeah and, and that idea of that translating to um, landscape, that, that does mm -hmm. make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, oh, that's right. So in the intro, um, we mentioned this amazing project, the Woven Year Project, mm -hmm. um, and I know prior to that that you were doing the 100-day weaving challenge. So how did you arrive at the reason for these big continual projects? Yeah. Um, when I first learned weaving in a more formal setting in school, we were introduced to frame loom weaving our first semester. Um, but it was really, I think, an exercise to understand um, essential components of the loom, right? When we upgrade to the frame loom, excuse me, floor loom or the tabletop loom. Um, we had an understanding of how we could lift up the different warp threads to create a pattern to actually um, build imagery um, in a more complex manner. Um, but we started out with the frame just to get a sense of um, the relationship between, again, the threads, um, how we can manipulate them to, um, to make something. And so um, I again, tried it out first semester of university, did not come back to the frame loom until about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago at this point, where I was making large scale work, making massive woven paintings, um, what I call them are woven paintings, just because again, of that natural dye practice and painting the yarns and creating these compositions that feel like landscapes. Um, so I was making these large scale works thinking a lot about um, how they would exist in the world. And um, quite honestly, it felt quite intimidating <laughs> to commit to a, a size, to commit to making something at that scale that could take 100 hours and not necessarily um, knowing the outcome of that work, thinking about just how it would find a home or exist in a collection or be put on view in a gallery. There was a pressure to it. And I was feeling as if almost the fun of making was no longer present. I was feeling um, quite stuck in my, my process and really felt compelled to step away from it so that I could almost reinvent the wheel within my practice. And it was at that time that I reread the Bauhaus uh, weaving theory. Um, there's a book by Ty Smith um, that focuses on the woman's um, weaving workshop in the Bauhaus. And in it, she talks about how play and experimentation was highly encouraged uh, to inform 
later designed design textiles or to um, support, I think, more ambitious projects, long form projects, full on collections, but really spending time to play at the loom, to work through um, the materials, to get an intimate understanding of these materials. Um, and so when I'm talking about these women, it was Annie Albers and Gunter Stozel and Otti Berger, and they were all spending a lot of time just playing and experimenting. And that's what really led them to the works that we know um, as, as theirs today. And so um, I initially thought that I would do that on my floor loom or on the frame loom, or excuse me, the tabletop loom, but then it just felt um, like an easy step towards focusing on frame loom weaving. I was traveling quite a bit. I was not in my studio as much, and I liked this you know, ability to pick up the loom at any point yeah. and, and work on the piece. And um, I also really enjoyed the limitations of that size, of that scale, um, and all of the pieces within the series are essentially plain weave, the most simple um, weave structure, right? The over, under, over, under. And um, basically you're just li lifting up the odd warp ends and the even warp ends, right? To create that pattern. And so I just really wanted to push that as far as I possibly could go. And so there was almost this sense of fun that came with taking the most simple thing and just pushing it as far as I could go. Right. Yeah. And so that started with the hundred days, which felt like a really wonderful project that still felt unresolved at the end. I felt like there was still a lot that I wanted to explore. And so naturally the following year, I, I ended up committing to a woven year where I've been making one piece a day um, throughout 2023, uh, to accumulate into 365 works. Um, so at the time of today's chat, what day is it today in that project? Oh my gosh. Um, you know what? I don't have it written down. No, I just know that I have all the pieces and how I'm counting or calculating it is when I share on Instagram. So okay. I haven't shared all the way to the point that we are today. I've only shared 210 pieces on Instagram, but I have a stack in my studio of pieces that are um, ready to be shared. And so I still have made a piece a day or quite transparently, there are some days where I make two or three because I know I can't weave on a certain day because life gets crazy. Um, and so I also don't see the work as being fully finished until I've added in the dried flowers, I've added in the shells, the ceramic pieces, the buttons. And so there are some pieces that feel really unresolved and I don't see them as finished until I've added that last element. Um, yeah. And so I think I'm at like 300, yeah, almost yeah, today, right? Um, and so there are a few that, um, are in a, a maybe pile, um, but okay. overall I'm at about 300 um, with so, only 210 shared on social media. And there's something about um, definitely viewing them individual, but also as the group. So for people that may not have seen them and we you know we flashed up some at the beginning relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, yeah, as it says here, that's perhaps the first hundred. So again, just there's just, I mean, repetition of something and multiples to me is always just a, a winner for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got some of the groupings. Mm -hmm. um, so then when we look at the individuality, so you say that um, the plain weave is the base of mm -hmm. each piece, is that correct? Yeah. Um, and then just like the sort of, I was looking at the, the terms architecture and structure, and mm -hmm. I think when I see these pieces, those words then do make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, and so do you have 
favorite, um, what kind of yarns are you working with and do you have a favorite, like how each day when you come into the space ready to do today's piece, do you have something in mind or yeah, are you following that play and experiment? Yeah, so I did pull a few where I really felt an immediate sense of gratification because of the material really speaking to me. Um, an example of that was when I started working with this uh, agave fiber. Um, so this is referred to as ixle um, in, uh, in Oaxaca, and it is essentially a, a raw fiber that's part of the agave plant. So when we um, mm. harvest agave for mezcal, they use the center spine, and then the rest of the spines that protect that center spine um, are not usable for the, the alcohol. So that is what they spin into yarn um, or thread or um, in this raw form, right? And so I really loved playing with this kind of um, raw material and then pairing it with hardware. I was gifted these kind of copper um, piping uh, little tubes. And so I really like this idea of contra like using contrasting material, something super soft and supple with <laughs> more hard. And um, then here I have a fiber that's called fique, which um, is really wonderful. It holds a lot of structure. You can see here that um, I did a, a basic plain weave, <laughs> like all my pieces, but left uh, kind of uh, spaces in between the weft to create a, a more, I would say, transparent um, piece. Like you can see my hand behind the piece, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that felt like a breakthrough, right? Uh, and then any of these pieces here where I've um, wow. you know, used pure banana fiber with um, that kind of S curve that I that I weave uh, the the thicker material um, through. I think any of those pieces where I really challenge that plain weave um, are are successful to me in my eyes. And I have another example with uh, this. This is a a black cotton. It's a super fine cotton uh, paired with that banana fiber. Um, but just the, the thick with the thin and the uh, more kind of soft material with the more coarse fiber, there's these contrasting elements here again with um, the fique. This is a yellow fique and uh, just a simple plain weave with a cotton weft. But then I've added these blue beads in that uh, create dimensionality on the top of the surface, right? And so this was a piece where I wove the yellow piece and then I came back to the piece about like two weeks later and added the beads in at that point, right? And so it didn't feel finished until the beads were added. And um, I think here's another one where I, I added some ceramic beads to uh, this green piece, which is, um, naturally dyed with indigo and pomegranate to create a really beautiful shade of teal. Um, and so there are pieces that definitely stick out in my mind as memorable. And when I first set out on this project, I thought quite frankly, I would have more associations with pieces being made on certain days. And there is a truth to that. But then I've also felt more and more that this project has taught me so much and in that um, in our human experience on this earth, we can't actually remember every single day what we did every day because we have these routines established where we go and work from nine to five um, or we spent our weekend catching up on errands and it wasn't actually that significant. And I think when I set out to do this project, I had this idea that each piece would be so incredibly unique from the other or be something where they would build off each other. But when I look at the 300 pieces that I've made so far, there are some pieces that are completely nondescript or they're clearly um, made at a point of exhaustion where I felt yeah. fatigue from the process and my it was, I just had a day at the loom where I didn't feel necessarily this creative spark um, or inspired by something or the other, or it just felt that I was doing something I had already done before. And that's a piece that feels maybe more mundane because it's not, tr it wasn't a breakthrough moment. It was just almost like a mechanized form of reproduction of something that I had done prior. 
And so there's like these contrasting or kind of conflicting ideas, right, of attempting to do this project where I create a collection of artworks with each one being unique when inherently mm -hmm. there's going to be elements that um, that come yeah. back. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. the pieces do feel um, quite similar to each other, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's just more of yeah. an outcome of uh, learning through this project, right? And it seems more true to life because that would reflect that sort of um, graph of experience, of um, moods and uh, activity, you know, like we're not going to be like that and we're not going to be like that. So it seems like um, that would reflect what's actually going on. So in right. terms of that, that project, um, when you began, do, did you know what's going to happen at the end? So I know from talking to you um, in preparation for this, um, that you're putting together a book at the same time and that you're working towards having the, the pieces into the gallery um, showing of this. So, um, yeah, do, do you have an idea of how the book might be coming together, like in terms of documenting text with the imagery or the flow or um, is that all still kind of um, in the organic uh, planning at the moment? Yes and no. I think... I've been writing as I've been making these pieces. Um, I've been taking notes, I've been journaling. And I think initially I did set out to have each page include an excerpt of that day. Um, but more so now I'm, I'm more compelled to having chapters within the book feel um, more focused on talking through these themes that I find within the pieces because kind of circling back to what I was talking about before with there being very similar elements between pieces. Yes, some of that's unintentional, but also a lot of it is intentional, right? We see it with the dried flowers or we see it with um, certain materials, certain colors. Um, and so I've thought thematically about how I want to lay out this book and having a chapter on this idea of labor and, and um, production and kind of talking about the contrast between um, the handmade and, and craft versus more of like a system of reproducing and those kind of tensions that I see within this practice, right? Um, and then I do want a chapter that's really focused on um, color and why I'm using certain colors and what those colors mean to me and why they're inherent to my practice and why you've seen them now a dozen times over, right? Or place. A lot of these works are made in Oaxaca. A lot of them are made on the coast of California and, and talking about those connections between mm -hmm. the materials and the land, right? And so initially I thought about, yeah, having an excerpt per piece, but more and more I've thought about being I think really intentional with with these chapters and having that speak about the work and then letting the photographs of these pieces speak for themselves with um you know a little kind of I think blurb about what they're made of to give context um but yes yeah, so I basically set out at the beginning of this year with a hope of being able to have an exhibition and to publish a book and uh, through this process have gained support by way of a Kickstarter that I um, I launched over the summer and then later with a really incredible um, opportunity through a grant. Um, and so this is something where, even though I set out with this, with having no idea of how this would actually come to fruition, it's being coming more clear as I um, kind of wrap up the year. I think likely spring is when this will be um, be established or kind of the book will be published and the exhibition will take place just because there will be a lot of um, time and attention that's needed to framing the works or displaying the works and, and kind of solidifying the space. Um, but I think that what I initially thought <laughs> when I set out to do this is nowhere near where I am today. And so I think that was part of the process mm -hmm. that was also really I think significant was just seeing the reception of this project and um, how people were either inspired to take on their own daily project or series um, in the woven medium or in another uh, process. And also um, just the support I, I gained from this um, has really been um, life-changing for my career. So it's it's been wonderful. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds so exciting and um, it'll be great to see it all come together. So, and also I think it's um, slightly deceptive because when we talk about small pieces and for me, small, you know, I, I work smaller than A5 most of the time, you know, like half US letter. Um, but those pieces that you held up before, that is the size of the pieces that you're doing every day, isn't it? So, um, yeah, they kind of are, because in, in scale to you, are bigger than sort of, you know, that. Mm -hmm. um, so what's a typical time frame that you spend each day on these um, everyday pieces? So to create one of these pieces, pieces which their scale is about, I would say, 9 to 10 inches by 13 inches, and obviously with how some of the um, materials are used, that changes, right? And also when the pieces are taken off the loom, that also changes because we lose that tension and they'll shrink or they'll expand depending on the materials I'm using, right? Um, and so with that scale, um, we are committing to, or I'm committing to making a piece that takes anywhere between two hours to four hours. Right. I'm using uh, not necessarily chunky materials in all my pieces, but I here, for instance, have eight or nine warp threads going through each um, knob or notch, right? So I have here, actually, this is a really fine linen, and there's 30 warp ends here to make a more chunky warp. Um, and then mm -hmm. again, with something like this, where... I actually did not pack down the fibers all the way. I'm using a finer weft, um, this fique. Um, it's not packed down all the way. So this piece probably only took me an hour and a half to make because of just the um, simplicity of it, right? Uh, whereas some of the other pieces might have taken longer. And how much time um, I dedicate to a piece is largely dependent on how much time I have in that day. Um, when I was doing this project in the early part of 2023, I was teaching five classes or four classes at Parsons um, and then also teaching online classes. And so I was essentially teaching full time and that meant waking up at 5 a.m. and trying to complete a piece before I went to uh, school to teach. Uh, and now I have this um, this gift of time to focus on this project now where my mornings are a little slower and I can devote more time to each piece. Um, or I also have that freedom of um, working more on these projects in the evening too because I'm not spending all this time grading. And um, that means that I'm my time's also becoming more devoted to making the pieces. And so those pieces that you'll see um, in the later part of this year that I'm still posting on Instagram or will be posting on Instagram in the coming weeks, those pieces are more complex. The materials are finer. There's more um, image building present. Um, and uh, I'd say the structures, those still in plain weave, um, there's more tapestry weaving happening within those pieces as well, um, just because I have the freedom um, to devote more time to it. Mm. And with that freedom of time and the play and the experimentation, sometimes if in a workshop situation or if I'm teaching, I kind of deliberately set um, constraints for people. Mm. So whether that's just a limited color palette or whatever, and people always are often surprised by what they can achieve with, you know, the constraints. So when you have um you know the, the piece for the, that day have you already selected in advance what the materials are or is that part of the organic process of that day and has that changed over the year from what you're choosing to work with any particular day yeah that's a great question i would say that constraints come into play um more so when I'm traveling, um, you know, if I pack my suitcase and I have um, only a set number of fibers with me, um, that's often uh, what I'll have for that duration of the week. Um, I would say also, you know, I'm teaching a lot of workshops as I'm doing this series and 
the materials that I use in my own work are the materials I also use in my workshops, right? So I'm using this like naturally dyed yarn or fike. And if students choose to use that and I'm on the road and there's only a little bit left, that's what's going to be used for the pieces. Um, but I don't necessarily set out with constraints from the outset of making that work. Right. Um, I have, you know, a stash of yarn in my studio. Um, I have yarn that I've acquired as I've um, made this series in different places. And um, I'd say it's less about constraints. It's more about like inspiration. So for instance, when I'm making the pieces in Oaxaca, um, I get a lot of my materials dyed there. So this is another example of a piece where this is like a, a blush pink and it's uh, dyed with cochinilla, which is from the uh, cochinilla insect um, that grows on the nopal cactus in, in Mexico and other parts of um, Central and South America and in the southwestern part of the United States. Um, but then I'm also pairing this with a Ixlay cord. So I showed that Ixlay earlier. This has been spun into a cord and it creates these really, I think, interesting um, sculptural elements within the piece, right? It's really fun to manipulate. And so I'd say it's less about constraints, but more about what I'm really excited to use. Um, and so that's like the first material I'll pick up when I go back to Oaxaca. I'll go to the a specific market called Centro de Abastos. And I have like my rope person where I always go and get my rope there. Um, and I just know that I'm gonna wanna use that in my pieces because it's still a material I haven't exhausted. I feel like I'm still finding new ways to incorporate it into the project and into my pieces. Um, and so I think a material at some point becomes like less of a problem solving um, material or kind of thing. And that's yeah. when I think it's time to move on or try something new. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's, um, it's kind of hard for me to engage my brain and ask questions because seeing those pieces, it does really seem like you're pushing boundaries of what people traditionally think of as, you know, weaving. Um, and then seeing that sculptural aspect is also really interesting. Um, but then also I'm not familiar with the, um, the fibers and, and many of the things that you're using. So is there any rules in terms of like a, in the, um, the woven year, are all the pieces woven like natural materials, for example, is that one of the kind of like the rules that they're all natural materials? Yeah, that's definitely a rule. Um, for the most part, they're all naturally dyed, um, there's a couple of exceptions where I've broken that, right? So for instance, again, this, this fique um, that we have here, this isn't naturally dyed. I can't source it naturally dyed at the moment, but I really appreciated the fiber itself. And so that was a rule that I broke because I initially thought all of the pieces would have, um, have color only introduced if it was from a natural source. Um, but, an example of a rule that I have kept is yes, all of the materials are natural. Um, I would say that most are cotton and linen. I don't use a lot of wool in my work right at this moment. Um, I use wool more so when I'm making rugs or I'm making um, more utilitarian um, pieces. And it's not because I have a dislike for it. I just have felt that the materials I'm drawn to using during this project have been more cellulose based, um, more plant based. Um, mm. And so I, I wouldn't say it's a hard rule. Uh, I would say that the biggest constraint really is the scale, right? I never go outside of this size. Um, sometimes only once or twice I've made a piece that's half the size of the loom, but that's something I'm excited to explore in the kind of final two months of this project, thinking about how I can maybe skip some of the uh, warp ends um, and so leaving larger gaps between um, the warp. And so I'd say the constraints are really the day, <laughs> trying to get that piece finished on the day, the scale, and then to an extent, the materials, yeah. Hmm. And then also for the dyeing, um, so, um, you, you're dyeing some of the pieces yourself and then, like you mentioned, you've got other people dyeing things for you. Um, um, and that kind of, I guess that sort of relates a bit to sustainability, like 
yeah, how do you sustain your own materials and practice and then um, incorporate that by, I guess, outsourcing or being gifted materials as well so that the whole thing is, um, you know, an endless the cycle. It's a, a loop rather than, yeah. Yes. So oh, most of the pieces in the series, if they are naturally dyed, uh, they're naturally dyed by someone else simply because of the time uh, commitment I've had with this project uh, to weaving a piece a day, um, taking up most of my, my time that I have allotted to my making practice. Um, there are examples of pieces where I have been able to dye the yarns myself, but I might have batched dyed all of those colors at one go in the beginning of a certain month, right? And I really love naturally dyeing. It's a really important part of my pro practice. But and uh, but as I've gone through this uh, year, it's just been a, a challenge to be able to to yeah. dye my yarns. And so, what I did find in the hundred day series that was a really wonderful thing was that I was able to collaborate or offer this sense of collaboration um, by working with dyers. And so mm. I work really closely with Tenino Amano, which is a uh, dye studio in Teotitlan del Valle, which is a town right side of Oaxaca City. Uh, it's famously known for its rug weaving traditions. Mm. Uh, and so they're in, in Oaxaca, Mexico. And so they naturally dye a lot of my yarns. And I just really enjoy that relationship of when I go to Oaxaca to make my work, which I'm doing um, every few months or bi-annually at this point. Um, I have a visit, I get to see them, I get to, to pick up my yarns, and I really enjoy having that kind of connection to the place. Yeah. And so yeah. um, I will return to dyeing my yarns for my future works, but at this point in time, uh, this is a really wonderful way to expand the project outside of just my own process. Yeah, practice. yeah. yeah I love that. And I just have to show this picture because it's also really nice too. Um, I mean, I love the contrast too of the, the skyline and then uh, there you are with the textiles. Um, who is that indigo there that you're working with? Or? Yeah, so that is on the rooftop of my studio. Uh, and I, I share my studio oh. with my partner. And so I was documenting the 100 day series last year and had a vat and really enjoyed being able to uh, die in the on the rooftop in the summer and and just have that natural light. Uh, light is such an important part of um, my practice. I have pieces that are direct responses to light. Um, and, and shadow that is cast onto something because of the way that light has a relationship with things on earth. And um, being able to have a dye practice where I step outside of like the actual kitchen, but be in, yeah. in you know, the landscape and, and here it's the urban landscape um, has felt really wonderful. Yeah. 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 When you think of um, dying in Brooklyn, until you see that image, you're not quite sure how that actually comes together. But yeah, um, yeah that's great to see. And then um, I'm not sure where this is. But again, I just love that um, we kept talking about the relationship to nature. So it's kind of uh, just seeing the pieces in yourself in relation to the earth and those textures. It kind of, yeah, is just um, more obvious. Yeah. Yeah, those were taken in Oaxaca at the start of this year um, when I was participating in the residency at Tishere, which is um, a textile residency um, just outside of Oaxaca City. And um, even the beads that were shown in those pieces, I know the ceramicist who's making those clay Aww. beads. Um, and so her name's Makrina. And it's been, I think, really wonderful to have, you know, those woven in or embedded into the woven substrate because I've been to her house, you know, four or five times. And every time people come to visit me in Oaxaca, we visit her home and it's, it's a way of creating connection, right. To a place. Mm -hmm. And it's really about intentionality. Again, the beads here too, right. Similarly um, made by yeah. Mujeres Barro Rojo. So yeah, I, I'd say that, those pictures were, you know, photographed to basically capture this this period of the project where, you know, the first 30 um, works 
of a woven year were made in Oaxaca. And um, so we, I wanted that as essentially an archive to be able to uh, include in the, the publication. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I am can't, can't wait to see it all, you know, like, yeah. I, yeah. I doubt if I'll be able to make it over to see the um, pieces in the gallery, but at least um, having it in print form will be, be wonderful to pour over all of that. And so I'm imagining, uh, so where, whereabouts is uh, this taken? Yeah, so I'm actually seated um, as if in this photo you see the desk. I'm actually seated at this desk right now. And so oh. this is in my studio in Brooklyn. Um, you're just seeing behind me is like the other side of the room where, right. you know, so uh, it's basically as I'm talking to you, I'm, I have all my works or quite a few of my works on the wall. Um, mm. So, yeah, the the colors and the textures, and it's always, um, I guess, with any kind of uh, natural material and dyes, and like in basket weaving, the variation, like that's kind of all the same color sway, but yet the variety in all of those pieces is is just incredible. Um, and then I guess this is the, the for the larger pieces, the um, floor loom. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the going back to the larger pieces, um, I just wanted to show uh, everyone this piece. Can you tell us um, about this? So this was a larger work I made quite a few years ago at this point. Um, it's dyed with indigo and iron and eucalyptus. And I think this is an example of where structure was more present on my floor loom pieces, right? This is with a waffle weave. Um, yeah. And so you get that kind of dimensionality. And so those are things that I'm really excited to return to when I go back to the floor loom. Uh, you know, this year I'm, I'm not touching my floor loom just because of how much mm -hmm. I, I'm weaving with the frame loom. Uh, but I think that's an example of how place really translates into um, my woven work. So that specific um, ocean is, you know, the Pacific Ocean, um, looking out onto the Pacific Ocean from California, from Northern California, right? So um, I try and, and create this reference to places that are, you know, pivotal to my upbringing or to, or still feel like home in many ways. Um, and so I'm still trying to do that same uh, approach in a lot of the smaller works that might be an example of how it feels more like a woven painting when you see the large scale version yeah. versus yeah. these small scale works feeling more like woven drawings or sketches to me in many ways. And yeah. I say woven sketches or woven drawings because I, a large part of this again is that play and experimentation to inform larger work. So taking um, some of these ideas, these elements that you see on the smaller pieces and then blowing them up to a larger scale or becoming an, an important part of a larger composition yeah mm. yeah when you see uh pieces like this and like that i think i don't know how to articulate this but just that sense of um many people would not even realize that the human hand has been evident in constructing that you know because it was so used to consuming manufactured things that yeah. the everyday person on the street wouldn't necessarily look at something like that and assume that it's handmade. And that's a real sort of, um, yeah, you know, it, it does make you pause and, and think about that, um, all of those things. Like I said, that was not a way of articulating that, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's I think that's interesting because when you see those pieces up close, there's intentional errors left in them. Uh, these pieces are typically stretched on stretcher bars, take up, quite a bit of wall space, but you can even see that there are warp threads that are doubled up or, you know, there are loose warp threads or weft threads coming off. And I am really fascinated by this notion that a lot of um, craft communities have where really only perfect cloth can be made by a higher being or spirit. Mm -hmm. And so some cultures actually intentionally include errors I would say um, adding in 
a mismatched color or I'm specifically thinking about in Pokhari and bog embroidery in Northwestern India, they'll leave an error in the cloth because to them in their eyes, God can only make perfect cloth, right? And so I really like this idea of maybe if it's not a higher spirit and thinking more about how we exist today with mass production of you know manufactured textile goods um, that feel perfect, how we can kind of reject that with the trace of the hand and adding in something that isn't necessarily um, a perfection. It's it's more of an error. Um, and so um, if there is a thread that's missed, not taking the time to go back and do it. And I've also really enjoyed that notion in thinking about this project because of um, letting that piece be a record of that day. And so there are days where my pieces feel more seamless than others just because of my energy levels or, or you know, how much time I was painstakingly like planning out that piece, right? Um, it's a concept that's still working through and thinking about how mm -hmm. I want to write about it as well uh, mm -hmm. because I think it's also a challenge, right? Because if that piece is, in ex is existing in a home, not everyone wants a piece that has, you know, a recorded um, mistake in it. And so how do I, is it important enough to keep in the work if it's something where most people mm -hmm. wouldn't want it there, right? And, and also, are you the only one that can detect the mistake anyway? Um, because often we're kind of our own worst critics and then, um, you know, we often see flaws in our work and then other people don't even realise that that's, mm -hmm. you know, not actually meant to be part of the, the piece itself. Yeah, I um, think weaving can be very unforgiving, though, because with yeah. the creative structure, the, the error can be very evident, too. And I think yes. especially working at this scale, when we only have this plane to see and there's... A thread that was missed it's either embracing oh. it or or going back and fixing it before it becomes too late right because we build the the structure onto itself right mm -hmm. so yeah still thinking about how i want to have that idea solidified within my practice or not yeah. Do i let go of it at some point Mm. And I was interested in that, um, you know, often with, again, fiber arts, there's that sort of phrase used, appreciation of the slow. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how does that kind of work for you and does it change over time? Like, do you still have the monkey mind of when you're working something, are you in the flow and completely um, obsessed, uh, absorbed by that piece? Or is your mind still thinking about, like, tomorrow's, chores or dinner or you know like and then you're you know because you know that you're going to be documenting it so sometimes when you step away from the loom is then that when the thoughts come or is it like a real conscious thing when you're working you have to keep bringing yourself back to the flow or are you just in the flow yeah i mean the most interesting part of that was when I set out with this project. Initially, I was planning on also documenting the process of making each piece just because we live in this digital age where my practice would exist without social media, but my business might not, right? And at the end of the day, this is still a career. And, and so I set out, you know, trying to document the pieces so that I could post that daily and or weekly um, to kind of gain new eyes on my practice. And that's when I felt the most disconnected, right? Because you're pausing to get the angle or to get the detail yeah. shot or to set the time lapse. And it just took the fun away from the project and it created this, again, the pressure. And I'm not negating that. I understand how important it is uh, for artists to be able to share their process and their work, to be able to get, um, opportunities and there's various ways in which we can get opportunities right but um, if we're thinking about some of the strategies have worked and some have not and when I've leaned into sharing my work online that's helped me get new opportunities right so that was an example of maybe something where I felt so um, disconnected with the making process and so maybe focusing less of my time on that has allowed me to feel more present again and 
you know, I compensate for that in other ways where sh I do still share the process, but maybe it's not as much, or, um, yeah. I, you know, I, I, um, do show a lot of, um, my work itself. Right. And it's still, um, offering something to my audience. Um, other examples where I haven't been as present, I think is again, when I woken up super early to make the piece before going to do, you know, my, um, other job, right? And as much as I appreciate having that opportunity to teach textiles, um, just the taking away from that space of like really setting the intention of making this work and feeling that pressure of time and compressing the time to get that finished before I go was where I felt again uh, less present. And so when I sit down and on a weekend, on a Saturday or Sunday where I don't necessarily have anything planned until the evening or afternoon. And I just have that freedom to, to explore some ideas. That's when I feel most present. And that might mean that there's music in the background or it's quite frankly, often silent and I'm really engaged in the process. And that's where I think this idea of like time stretching really comes to play where you lose track of time, where, you feel um, completely immersed in the process and it becomes almost meditative. Um, it becomes this opportunity to reflect more on the past works that I've made. It becomes this opportunity to think through on a granular level instead of having maybe those kind of uh, distractions that we have yeah. um, around our practice. And mm -hmm. so that's yeah. been, I think, a really experience. Yeah, I can really relate to that. And also when artists talk about applying for grants or residencies or um, applications for various things, you know, it's gone beyond just submitting your CV or having a website that people do often look to social media presence and all of that sort of stuff. But also, um, yeah, then people say when you're posting on social media, it's not always about the end finished products, people need to engage with it. And so they're going to engage with process. But I completely relate to that because often what I'm doing is process led. And so you can't stop and start recording yourself because you don't know where it's going. And then to talk yeah. about have a voiceover at the same time, I don't think everyone often realizes how complicated that is to have all of those parts of your brain going at the same time. And, and yeah, sometimes you just want it for you and you just want to enjoy that flow without having to record everything for everybody else. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I completely relate to that. Um, so you mentioned once before, uh, earlier about uh, Rauschenberg. So what other artists have inspired you along your way? Oh, that's such a, um, a, I mean, so many. I studied art history in undergrad. It was my minor, um, or actually I did a dual degree in art history and in, in fiber material studies. So I wouldn't say it was a minor, it was like more of a double major. And then I went on to study, um, basically it was a, a program in uh, design history, object study and material culture is what I hold a master's in. And yeah. that was two years of looking at art in a variety of forms um, beyond mm. maybe, um, art with a capital A, like we know with paintings and sculptures in a white cube setting, it's also looking at objects, right? And it's various um, uh, kind of phases of history too, um, more of a craft, more, more, and, and I think these kind of art craft design, they all intersect and they all kind of lap over each other. Um, but at the same time, that means that I feel I, I, there's just so much that truly informs this work. I could talk about, um, you know, textiles from certain centuries or cultures, but also there's yeah. a lot of modern contemporary and contemporary art that really informs this practice because I kind of straddle, right? Craft, mm -hmm. design, and art. And, and you mentioned some of the women, women um, in the Bauhaus and for right. those that um, are not familiar, it's definitely worth looking at, at their work um, completely. Yeah, yeah. I would so, say was, that, sorry, I would say like, sorry, to, to kind mm -hmm. of conclude, I would say that I could not do this project without Sheila Hicks being a pivotal person yes. in modernist weaving and in, in modern art. 
she's yeah. um has a book called weaving as metaphor where she did these smaller works um now she's working at a much larger scale uh but there's definitely traces from that project that you see come into my practice um sometimes intentionally sometimes just subconsciously just because i've spent a lot of time researching her process uh, her practice and so yeah. it, i can't have this practice talked about without having um, her mention just because she is such an, an influential person in, in my my um art career yeah mm -hmm. and i'm excited to see that she has a piece coming to melbourne um in mm -hmm. december for a part of the um triennial so um that's going to be exciting to see um yeah and i i think you kind of just answered that but also um and we spoke a little bit about this in preparation, that idea of when you're researching so much and researching to um, cultures and cultures that have specific patterns and motifs, um, how difficult is it to retain your own individual style and not be influenced by all of those other things that you've researched along the way? Has that been difficult or can you just sort of block it out? Yeah, so with weaving, um, one of which is one of the oldest art forms on this earth, um, it was invented in a variety of different parts of the world almost at the same time, almost simultaneously. It was invented with this um, need to solve the problem of shelter and protection um, for humankind. So we see woven uh, buildings, right, with um, reeds woven into each other, or we see um, woven garments um, from centuries ago, too, still being preserved in museums. And um, what that means is that even though there might be motifs that we see across the globe in different communities, they're all rooted with an ancestral um, wisdom and indigenous knowledge. And so a large part of my master's degree was focused on learning about indigenous textile practices. And I think that's been really important in understanding how I have my own practice that's informed by something that is inherently um, indigenous weaving um, is and how to not, I would say, uh, appropriate certain elements mm -hmm. to a point where um, it feels as if it's, it's stolen. And so I've think the biggest gift from having taken, you know, years of, of textile history and art history is really trying to find that space where I can exist, where, of course, there's things that influence um, me that might feel similar, but still feeling like I'm carving out my own um, yeah. visual language um, that doesn't feel like it's disrespecting others. Um, yeah. And yeah. so I, I, I think it's, something that has also taken a long time to um, to learn in terms of um, finding myself and finding that visual language, right? Um, but through this process, really creating that distinction between inspiration and appropriation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, that all makes sense. And like our time has flown by, but I just knew that it would be so interesting talking to you because I just knew that there'd be all these uh, tangents and topics that would just come out of um, of your work. And um, I just have to show it again because my brain still needs to think about what you just said. Um, and they are all unique and they are woven drawings and sketches and they're so beautiful and I hope for everyone watching this that we've covered some of the topics that are interesting to people tuning in and that I've tried to ask questions that you would have been um, asking and wanting Jesse to um, answer. But also I think the beauty of this being a recording um, is that people can slow it down and go back because so much of what you've said really needs them to pause and have us think about a little bit more consciously and um, and, and really give thought to. So thanks for um, covering all of those things. And 
thanks for your time today too. It's been it's been so interesting. And those fibers and the people that you've mentioned, I'll have to. Um, what was that one starting with F that I didn't quite catch? The the there's like a fika of fiber or something. Okay. Yeah, fika. Fika from Colombia. Um, oh, yeah. So it's, it's a plant, or yes. Yeah, it's it's spun. I don't. I guess I'll have to send you a link to that process so you can oh, see weird. how yeah. it's it yeah. really lustrous uh, material. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'll play our outro, but yes, thank you again for um, sharing all your process and uh, practice with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share my work with you all. And thank you for such wonderful questions. Oh, that's <laughs> always like, la, 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 la. but yes, so much, so much to cover. And I had so much that I was going to ask, but then we just went off. But yeah, yeah. I think I've, I've covered it all. But, and thanks everyone to tuning in from wherever you're watching this from. So yes, really appreciate that. Thank you.